Have you ever played e4 trying to face e5, but instead they just uh, hit you with their evil brother, c5, the so-called Sicilian defense? Well then, this is the video for you because I'm gonna be showing how to destroy the Sicilian defense in 11 moves and oh boy, we're not only gonna be annihilating this opening, but it's gonna be so satisfying, almost as you luckily received an extra crispy in your KFC bucket. I mean, personally, I would never eat junk food like that. I mean, as you can see, I'm already a certified fashion icon. So in case you run into me in your local KFC, don't bother to ask for a picture because that is just my twin brother. So for educational purposes, I'm gonna be playing three games against lower rated players trying to highlight my thinking process as an international master, showcasing some of the main ways to exploit their super common mistakes. So enough with the nonsense, let's just dive right into the action. Okay, 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 getting another white game. So I'm gonna be sticking with the Kings one and we do get another Sicilian. Looks like it's Miff Mora Gambit Day. So just gonna stick with that. And let's see if opponent is gonna accept. Now they could also decline, by the way, that's also an option. But I think they will mainly accept in your games, which is leading to an interesting position. Because kind of like no matter what black does, uh, what makes this gambit actually so powerful is the fact that you could literally play the every single move the same way and it's just super powerful. It's just almost like the London system version of E4, except you're down opponent. The position is losing, but, but besides that, there is no difference. No, I, I'm just kidding. Okay, guys, this is not a losing opening. If you think the Smith Mora is losing, you're like really horribly wrong on that because we best play is just equal, it's zero, it's just that. So, like, what I actually hate about the Smith Mora, personally speaking, it's not when they accept, but the fact that they could just force me to play an Alapin if I'm not like in the mood, you know, it's just like, uh. That makes it pretty annoying with moves like knight f6 or d5. We just have to play an alapin. So, um, yeah. Now when they dig, it obviously becomes pretty interesting. So, just going to go knight f3 and then bishop to c4. Mainly against everything. So, opponent goes knight f6, okay? So, in the previous game, we actually went for the simple move castle. But let's try out this little idea. Let's see how are they dealing with e5. Because I feel like this is a very common position for these rating range specifically. And I think below 1500 as well. So e5, okay, is he gonna take? It's not like the best move for him to take. As I mentioned, like knight g4 and knight d7 are a bit better. But he does go for takes. So we're gonna be going queen d8 and um, against king takes. Do you remember what the key move was? The key move was to actually go knight g5. Not only bishop takes an f7, which is reasonable, but knight g5 is even more annoying. And against this, uh, what's the main idea? Well, it looks like the pawn remains undefended, which is kind of true. We can take, but after e6 or a6, uh, I mean, mainly a6 actually, black is just better. So the key idea you really want to watch out for if you're planning to use the Smith Mora. So point is knight b5. And black simply doesn't have an easy way to defend against this fork. I mean, I'm honestly genuinely expecting my opponent to play rook b8, which... Uh, yeah, I still think he's gonna be in uh, a lot of trouble. Now, I'm not super sure what the best continuation objectively should be for us. But I've got like a few candidates. So, um, yeah, I feel like checking is probably the least appealing move in that position because it's just king d7 and it's attacking our knight. So, I feel like rook b8, we have a very nice move which will be threatening mate in one. And that is knight e5. Threatening knight c7. Literally checkmate. So, he does go king d7, but now this comes with a check. Oh my god, this is so good. Look at this, guys. So we take only square. He has to go back. And then we get a checkmate with the knight in like 11 moves. This is absolutely mind-blowing. Oh my god, I cannot believe how powerful this tactic actually really is. Guys, if you're like really watching this, you really want to uh, try out this opening. At least, I don't know, below 1500. You could easily get this every single time. Knight c7. 
just look at this chick. I mean, I, I mean, what is this? You have to play this. I mean, literally, if you're not, I don't know what you're doing with your life, really. So, um, yeah. I think there's literally no analysis that should be done. Maybe. I'm just like kind of curious on what if rook b8. So uh, what is like the optimal move? So computer suggests like a very weird knight c7, king d7, knight b5. And thinks knight e5 is inferior. But I kind of get it. So this is just to make sure that he's losing the right of castling, and then you're creating a threat of taking with check. So in reality, you're not actually losing a tempo. You're just getting this position, but he lost the right to castle. So it's like a little bit of a better version compared to taking immediately. So white has very promising position. I mean, if they go e6, you can go for like, I mean, knight c7, bishop e3, bishop f4, so many tempting moves. I mean, I would probably just play this in game and Looks like the rook is in a little bit of trouble, so it has already big advantage. So, um, with that being said, I think we can really move on to the following game. Right, everybody, getting a wide game, and uh, we're gonna be opening up with e4. Hopefully, getting a Vienna, unless they go for the Sicilian defense. So, I think against the Sicilian defense, for now at least, we're gonna be sticking with the. Uh, sort of risky, but very uh, rewarding, especially for this rating range, the Smith Mora Gambit. And opponent actually declines the Gambit. Now, this, theoretically speaking, is giving us a pretty large advantage after the move CD4 because we do get the center of the pawns. Uh, before, uh, what was the main move for black? You may be wondering. Well, here they have a choice between either accepting the gambit or transposing into the Alapin Sicilian with either knight f6 or d5. Once again, if you're playing this in like below 1500, these guys have no idea about transpositions from one opening to the other. But, you know, because you're like constant viewer of the channel, you're going to get there and you're going to need these sort of things. So for now, he just goes uh, for the move knight c6 and... I'm gonna be playing knight f3, simply inviting him to take on c3 once again. Uh, not that waiting with the center of the pawns won't be instructive, but this way I feel like uh, it's way more interesting to get into the actual gambit. So I'm gonna go bishop to c4. And opponent plays the move knight f6, which is leading to a very interesting position where... We basically have two main options, so one of them we could actually just go for a trap which, believe it or not, would just uh, give us a win in like three moves from now, if opponent sort of blunders there, or the other thing that we could go for, we could just play it standard, how do we do that? We simply castle, queen e2, rook d1. Bishop f4, rook ac1, e5 or knight d5 ideas, and in general, white has very good compensation. So, uh, I bet you guys want to see the trappy one. Like, e5 would be the trappy one, and if he takes with a knight, that's losing the queen after takes. And then the key idea, bishop takes on f7. Drawback of this, in case he takes with a pawn, we're not really going to have... Uh, Anything, frankly speaking. So I'm just gonna stick with the standard play for now. And yeah, bishop to g4. Uh, okay, this is interesting. So it definitely kind of uh, gives me uh, Legal's checkmate vibes. Like if you play a move like knight e5, bishop takes on d1, bishop takes on f7. Now, it definitely makes no sense to play the move knight e5 since you can just capture the knight, but... It's just kind of like a common idea that I get whenever I see a position like this. Also, bishop takes on f7 could be a standard motive combined with like knight g5. But the issue here is that uh, the knight protects the bishop, so that's not going to be working. Now, what could be another interesting move that's uh, sort of breaking this pin? I feel like we could go for the move queen b3, which is directly hitting f7. But not only that, we're also attacking the b7 pawn. So I don't really see a very good way for black to defend against both rats. And 
even though it appears that we allow these sort of risky bishop takes on f3 move, I think we're going to have a lot of attacking ideas in exchange. So I feel like we can definitely play this move and um, maybe opponent now has a choice between e6 and bishop back, but against like both. Uh, I think we can go for queen takes b7, hitting the knight, and I feel like black is in a pretty awkward position because I'm about to reinforce the pressure on the knight by going for the pin. So in this position, I mainly expect the opponent to play the move rook to c8, and I'm not super sure what we are supposed to do. I mean, uh, yeah, candidate move, definitely bishop to b5. And then I will be generally expecting the move queen to d7. However, not very easy to follow up the initiative. I mean, yes, at the end of the day, we could just trade queens and play like what appears to be an even endgame. But of course, I'm wondering whether there's actually more. So uh, yeah, rook c8, not quite sure, but we actually see a pretty common mistake. Now it's actually your turn to perhaps even go ahead, pause the video and try to find the winning blow for why. Because what the opponent does with this knight a5 move, he's simply kind of misplacing the knight while making the king a little bit more vulnerable. So uh, what should we start uh, calculating first? Of course, the most forcing move. So it's either captures on or checks basically so uh queen takes on a8 is not a good move i don't know why would you consider that you bozo but bishop to b5 it's actually a pretty annoying check so what can he do he can only play knight to d7 but then you can notice that the queen is actually a bit overloaded having to defend both the knight and the rook from the corner which means we can just eliminate the knight he's gonna have to take with the queen but then the rook will remain undefended. So you can just go for this and um, yeah, we're winning at least a rook. So let's see. He's literally forced to play uh, knight to d7. I'm gonna go for uh, the move that I suggested. And I guess king e7 just uh, runs into... Wait, why, why is king e7 bad? Maybe it's not. I was thinking we could do bishop c6, but forgot the knight moves backwards, guys. So grandmaster secret right there. You made it this far into the video. The knight uh, does move backwards as well. So I was about to forget that myself uh, on the move king e7. Now, how are we supposed to actually refute this? I mean, probably just the simple queen b5, making sure the bishop remains defended. Also, we could play queen a6 with the idea that in case he decides to grab with the queen, the knight draws, but then he can also take with the king. So I feel like this move is important. And on rook to b8, we have queen a4. And same idea, bishop on d7 is immortal because the knight has to be protected. Otherwise, we can just move the bishop on the next move, I would assume. Uh, so yeah, by the way, you guys could also pause the video and think about potentially another idea that uh, this queen b5 move had because there is nothing wrong with queen a4, but maybe there could actually be something even stronger. And it's important all the time in these sort of positions to sort of watch out on the whole board. So for that, we do have the move queen g5, not only checking, but also targeting the bishop. So. We're not really gonna win a piece, we're basically trading, but we definitely secure the extra piece, which is pretty nice if you ask me, so, um, yeah, kind of forced to take, um, just collect the bishop, and then we will be trying to finish development, that's kind of the uh, only thing that we need to do, so finish development. Then exchange as many pieces as we can. So, just takes there. Now, we could definitely consider a move like maybe 
Bishop to f4 trying to develop, but what is the problem with this? It leaves the b2 pawn undefended. That is not like the end of the world, but uh, you don't really want to allow any kind of play if possible. So I'm going to start with the move rook to d1. Just keeping an eye on the backward pawn on d6. And then I think we can start uh, maybe playing bishop f4 with a tempo. So it does play knight c6. Now... I have to rush a little bit because uh, we don't have that much time on the clock. So I'm just going to play b3. Idea is to go bishop a3 and focusing on the d6 target. And by the way, somebody asked in the comments, why is my time uh, jumping all the time? So the idea is that we get five seconds uh, each move. So we're playing five minutes and five seconds increment, which makes the time scramble. Yeah, kind of doable. So whenever you have like a winning position and there is still increment, I mean, it's just like a game changer. Basically, people don't realize, but playing with or without increment, a lot of the times could be like basically two different games. Because in one, you can rely on flagging, and in the other one, as long as you get a bad position, you will normally lose because opponent just gets time every single move, so you cannot flag him. So, uh, which time do I recommend in case you want to improve? I think this is a pretty difficult question to answer. I think it very much depends on uh, every individual case because um, obviously the goal of playing these games, you want to be sort of comfortable with, with the time, okay? You don't want to be playing Blitz when, let's say, you just started chess because it will be pretty tough for you to... Let's say get out of the opening and still have time on the clock. So as long as you feel like time is not an issue, you can get out of the opening and let's say have at least like, let's say you start with five minutes, you have two minutes and a half after move 20. I think that is pretty reasonable. So you could play five minutes and uh, I definitely recommend uh, increment for most of the times, especially for beginners. It is true that it's going to be harder to find uh, players, but... From my experience, if you're below 1800 at least, you should be able to find games easily in 5 plus 5. Above 2000 becomes a bit trickier, I have to agree on that. Um, not many people are playing this time control, but um, also if that's like too fast, you could do 10 minutes or even 10 plus 5. So um, yeah, whatever time could work, it's just that... Every time you play a game, you want to be analyzing it a little bit after you finish. Do like a quick blunder check, see whether you could have improved your opening by using some of the courses that you own or whatever theory you have. And uh, yeah, you just don't want to be playing games uh, one after the other without really trying to learn anything. Even though that could still help, um, you're just, you know missing a lot of value if you're not analyzing your games it's like if you're playing a poker game you could say like like you're leaving a lot of money on the table if you're not analyzing your games so hope that kind of clarifies it while uh my opponent is definitely napping can i report for stalling let's see uh i just want to show this because many people are not aware oh never mind he played made a move uh okay what do we do now uh this is the weakness, so we just press on the weakness. Double up. Always, guys, just feels like an overwhelming game as long as you don't know uh, what to focus on. So it's important to be able to sort of assess the position and then it's way easier to come up with a right plan. So it's always we try to focus on our stronger side against the opponent's weaknesses, hopefully, if you can. So that is the d6 pawn. We have a threat of taking. He's probably going to move away, and then we could still uh, sort of pinch down this pawn with a move like queen to g3. Uh, obviously, anything wins in this position, but this is like the simplest. Could have taken on e7 as well, but I just kind of rushed a little bit because of the time scramble. Now, the only thing important is not to blunder the queen. I can also check, but in general, whenever you have a situation like this, when you're up a piece, you should aim to trade queens and get it to, to the end game. Make sure to not forget about this tension and now we can um, exchange everything and after 97 the reason why taking is actually fine is that when he doubles up we can simply take and it's important that remember the gm secret the knight covers the rook because they do move backwards i know how crazy so exchange everything and then the king and pawn endgame will be just really a walk in the park very easy to 
convert the opponent simply dead lost um yeah now uh what do we do now you'd be tempted to say okay let's just go for the pawns maybe push this but that would be a mistake so number one rule in the end game the king becomes one of the main attacking pieces so we need to bring, bring the king closer to the middle and then we decide so i'm gonna try to bring my king as close as i can to the center he's gonna do that and now time to activate the knight so i can no longer activate the king now in case he goes to b4 we have a little fork picking up the pawn and uh, i can go knight takes on a7 by the way i forgot to add the highlight move for some reason it was not uh, turned on let me just do that uh, in a second. Uh, how do I do that? Enable pre-moves. Wait a minute. Highlight last move. I don't have that. Anyways, I don't want to get flagged. So um, yeah, I'm just going to like go ahead and uh, promote this while I still need to figure out the setting. Oh, highlight moves. Jeez, it was the first one, really. <laughs> Okay, sorry for that, guys. In case this was any confusing, like, trying to follow the game, I apologize. I haven't noticed that the highlight move feature was disabled, so it happens. <laughs> the game might have disabled it when I was trying to make a thumbnail. And, okay, opponent now just um, probably quits. So I can, like, really report for stalling, but he's going to get flagged again. So that's like not even worth uh, taking the time to send the report. So, um, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, you may be wondering, okay, this potentially didn't look like the greatest fight of all time, but there is actually something very interesting that could have happened in the opening that I really want to quickly highlight. So the main idea is that, well, I, you remember I mentioned there's like a position where we could literally win in like five moves. Now maybe wondering okay i didn't get how does that happen so you remember i mentioned the movie five and i said if they blunder we get a quick win so the blunder is to do knight e5 is then after knight takes pawn takes bishop takes on f7 king has to take because the other squares are taken and then the queen remains undefended that's a lonely queen and white just wins now the main reason why i haven't played this is because this is not a forced move. So he could also take with a pawn. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's actually check with a computer. Oh, apparently the computer still likes this position, which is something pretty odd. I wasn't aware of this. So, like, if you take, clearly taking with a king uh, loses f7. But apparently white has a great position here after the move knight b5. And it seems to be very tricky for black to deal with this knight c7 fork so yeah i thought actually here my only move is 95 where of course he could do whatever and we're just down a point in an end game which is a pretty sad scenario so yeah you could actually go e5 and that's just a pretty interesting move apparently he's not forced to take and could move the knight to any of these squares from my experience they will take most of the time so keep this idea in mind too but in case you're unable to figure out whether e5 is working or not you could just castle and play the standard way. And apparently queen b3 was top line here to uh, create pressure. Now, the only thing here was rook c8, bishop b5, queen d7. I didn't see like a clear way to continue, but apparently just um, even the end game is much better, even queen a6. But why is this end game like plus two? I don't really get it. So he takes bishop b7. Why is this so good? Oh, not the bone cloud, of course, but how is this winning? I guess it's only winning because there's bishop c6 and then the pawn becomes very weak, but that wasn't really that intuitive for me during the game. So besides that, I think the game was pretty well played. Basically, we won the game with this idea, queen b3, that's uh, highlighting the double attack and why developing the bishop this early was a mistake. So uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it about this game and we can just move on to the following one all right everybody getting the white pieces and we're gonna be trying out another vienna let's see if we can get a game that is uh, not against a cheater so 
In case you missed that, you may want to check out the video that will appear on the screen. But it seems that opponent is going for the very aggressive Sicilian defense, which in this rating range, I really like to tackle by going for the Smith Mora Gambit with d4. And then the point is not to take with the queen because that doesn't make a lot of sense since our queen will be pretty vulnerable because of a knight c6 type of idea. But you can go ahead and sacrifice a pawn with c3. So that is kind of the nice part about this. If you're liking lower rated uh, games, I definitely recommend uh, anything but the open Sicilian for you, at least below 1800. So if you're looking for an opening, uh, stuff like uh, Knight C3 or uh, yeah, like going Grand Prix attack, um, Smith Mora Gambit, like Close Sicilian. All of these are uh, very interesting uh, options. Now, I know you may be wondering, uh, cannot we just go for the Alapin and try to build a massive center by playing C3? I think that is pretty good. So, related to the Alapin, that is the opening that I hate the most with both colors. So, uh, I've heard rumors that people who play C3 never get a girlfriend. So, it's up to you. Uh, opponent accepts my uh, Smith Mora Gambit. The sad part about the Smith Mora is that opponent can still transpose to the Alapin if they play the moves Knight of 6 or D5 here, which is kind of ironic in a way. But the good news is that if you're playing in this rating range or like at least below 1500, I feel like most of the times your opponent will accept the Smith Mora or they will decline by playing D3, which is also really good news i get a good position usually there against e6 just gonna develop my knight so the really nice thing about the smith mora is that it's so easy to play you can literally get away by uh doing the same setup every time knight on f3 bishop c4 queen goes on to e2 rook from from f1 goes to d1 uh this bishop usually goes on to f4 attacking the d6 pawn the rook literally goes to c1 all the time because it's the open file and we're going to have a lot of pressure. Either e5 or knight d5 ideas. Simply very easy to play. Now, I know some of you uh, that are not familiar with the opening may be wondering, well, I've heard gambits are not really good. Should we go for a gambit? Well, gambits are usually pretty questionable yes i mean unless you're planning to play the queen's gambit which is not really a gambit in itself because white can win the pawn by force uh most of the gambits are questionable but when it comes to the smith mora i think with best play for both sides you're just going to get an equal position so i think it's completely fine and even easier to play as white a lot of the time so opponent plays an interesting line which i'm not very familiar with move by move. I'm gonna go bishop c4 anyway, just apply <clears throat> the main strategy that uh, I told you guys should. So I'm gonna be a man of my word and gonna go for we need to rook d1, bishop to f4. I'm a simple man, I know what I want to do from uh, my Smith Mora. Okay, opponent may get a good position if he knows how to play this properly. That's really not that relevant, however. Just gonna do this in case of b5 and go back. Now, in some positions, you've got ideas to sacrifice the piece. However, I don't really see the point in this specific case. I'm just gonna slide back. Yeah, I think opponent, this guy is like playing really well for his rating, okay? I'm gonna be honest and I'll give you that. Huh. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'll give you that. He's playing fairly good. Now I'm going to go bishop to d6, uh, which is already kind of entering the middle game part. Just trying to exchange his uh, dark square bishop so that we get a nice and uh, cozy place for the rook on d6, which will allow me to apply further pressure onto the uh, kind of backward d7 pawn. So opponent plays knight c8, hitting my rook. All of his moves are like very sensible so far. Now, we have a choice between two moves, basically. We can go rook to d2 or rook to d1, I feel like. 
which one do you guys uh, think is better? Personally, I think I prefer D2, just because you want to keep uh, the D1 square available to double up the rooks. Okay, opponent just goes D5. I feel like D5 is a mistake. If I had any kind of slight suspicions that my opponent might be a cheater, I think this move is sort of a clear tell that he's not, or at least he's a bad one. Because, yeah, I feel like he's just opening up the position in our favor. So, yeah, we'll have to take the pawn. There is not much to do besides that. It's just that we're going to get a symmetrical type of position where simply my pieces are more active. So, hey, not too bad of an outcome. Um, yeah, as I was saying, speed more is equal. Most of the times you're going to be able to win back the pawn just because you are like too active and the opponent has to... Uh, give up on it basically at some point now we got a very interesting choice between rook d5 bishop takes or knight takes and i have no idea which one is better to take just because all the options are like so tempting hmm what do you guys think we should play like sort of intuitively i want to take you with a knight just to have like a very juicy knight but also i mean taking with a bishop Cancelling this guy, putting pressure on f7. I think I want to go bishop takes. While setting up another pretty funny trap, guys. Are you uh, aware of the big threat that uh, white has? Okay, I mean, there is bishop c6 idea, yes, of course. But there is something else also. And in case you guys were able to find that, we're also threatening bishop takes on f7. We check. And then the enemy queen will uh, remain undefended. So, um, yeah, let's see. It's a very difficult position uh, to play for black, I feel like. Like in these type of situations, uh, like kind of the dream scenario for black would be to somehow trade all the pieces and uh, make a draw. But also the other side uh, of the coin is that He's just so much more passive and gonna have a very hard time grading counterplay play because there's no like any pawn break that he sh can go for. And um, yeah, it's just super symmetrical. We are better. So, already burning a lot of time with this, uh, with this move. I mean, probably, actually, I don't know. It's tough. Maybe he's supposed to do queen e7. Offering queen trade because queen f6 I feel like allows a very strong move for white, uh, which is knight e4, just sent rising and gaining even more time. So I feel like queen e7 trying to kind of liquidate things, followed by uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe we should try to keep queens in that position. It's not like an easy thing to do so. A move to keep queens there could be like queen f1 um, and then try to play rook e1, gain the tempo against that e7 queen. But also f1 is a bit of a funny square, so we'll have to check that later in the analysis uh, tab after the game. But I suspect queen f1 was interesting there. Queen f6, yeah, we're going to stick with the idea of just uh, activating the knight. We were able to figure that one out in advance. He's going to go queen to g6. And we've got a bunch of interesting options in that position. We can either continue with uh, harassing the queen by playing the move knight h4. Uh, what else can we do besides that? I mean, yeah, we can like definitely bring the rook into the game. I guess rook c1, something like that. Put pressure on the knight and creating a little bit of a threat with... Bishop c6, knight e5 ideas. Not quite working, but get the point. So yeah, I think queen g6 is basically only move. I mean, he can go to f5 also, but that feels pretty suspicious to me. <laughs> this feels like uh, we should have something in uh, in that position. Also, like... The fact that opponent is spending so much time, it's a clear indication of how uncomfortable his position really is. Um, 
yeah, I think Queen G6. We could go for something like Knight H4. What is he gonna play then? Wow, that's actually he's almost trapped. Like only square that I can see is H6. But I feel like we have a very strong move there. And we could go for something like maybe knight f5. So yeah, just gonna continue with this idea. Just trying to keep up the tempo, not uh, giving him any time to uh, consolidate. And yeah, as I was saying, this is sort of only move. And then we have knight f5, further activating. He's gonna have to play queen g6. So we have at least like the draw in the pocket with. Uh, knight to h4 if we want but i don't think that's the case okay now mm, considering a move like knight d6 with a bit of a trap but i don't think it really works that well hmm my idea was to somehow deflect the knight so we have ideas to fork at some point but Oh, oh, never mind. It doesn't work. <laughs> I was thinking we could take and go rook d6, but he could simply pick up the f5 knight. So, yeah, this is actually like an interesting position. And I feel like the best move might be quite surprising to a lot of you that are watching. So you can go ahead and uh, try to pause the video. I think this is an interesting uh, position. And I'm going to do something that's... Arguably looks pretty dumb, but hey, I don't see the refutation, so I may very well just play it. That is g4. Now, the point with g4 is that I'm reinforcing the strong knight, plus I'm saying, okay, let the opponent make a move, and usually they will just blunder, like he did. So, once again, feel free to pause the video and... Uh, find the completely winning continuation that white has and i'll give you a little bit of a hint as well it stays in the fact that uh, this knight is like really poorly misplaced not that it could be like well misplaced or anything you get it so uh the knight is blocking coordination between the rooks so they cannot defend each other and that allows us to go for the little uh, discovery with knight f6 check now we can pick up the rook and Funnily enough, it's also going to be a checkmate, so hey, bonus points. Okay, so apparently we just managed to win this on time. Opponent uh, didn't make any moves, but uh, yeah, it was also first mate, as you can see, indicated by the evaluation. So really the most interesting part of this game, I feel like it was just the previous move, where if you remember, I said G4 is a very strong move in my opinion. It took me like a minute to find, so usually when I spend a lot of time, it leads to a pretty bad decision. But let's see, according to this computer, whether G4 was any interesting or not. And you can actually see G4 best move. Now, the funny thing is, you see Knight H4 as like the best move, but that's only if you follow the line, it's repeating, and then very next move is playing G4. So I think G4 is very strong because... Opponent simply has no moves. Just think about 97. I think that was a blunder because there is simply takes and pick up free bishop. So after g4, he is basically completely tied down to defense. It's basically like a turtle that has just fallen on its back. Has like nowhere to go and uh, we can just keep improving our position. So I wasn't afraid of something like h5, by the way, because there is at the very least a move like h3. Okay. Maybe there is uh, something stronger, of course, but just for a fact, h3 is pretty safe there. So, um, yeah. Related to this g4 move idea, whether, uh, yeah, I know a lot of you may be scared to take such bold decisions, which I completely understand. I mean, it's not an easy move to find. It will definitely take you a little bit of time to... Uh, understand when to pause and yeah go for this type of decisions but it is not something that you really need to be good at in order to be successful with the smith mora so uh, as long as you know where to develop each piece yeah just remember this is kind of 
um, yeah, the position that you get here. Opponent played like a very good line. I was really surprised by the way he handled this. But we went for like a typical idea to trade bishops. And after that, um, yeah, I actually saw he has something like knight b6, rook d1. I feel like computer is kind of overestimating black's position a little, but maybe I misplayed it a little myself with uh, bishop to d6. But generally, white has very easy play. And uh, yeah, opponent simply felt so under pressure that he went d5, which yeah, simply after bishop takes on d5, interesting move. He was supposed to play queen e7 where, yeah, this was best move. And the computer really likes the idea of playing bishop e4. The queen f1, not even like top five move, which kind of makes me question my existence and the choice of my career. But uh, is queen f1 that bad? I'm wondering. Apparently there's knight b6 and black is okay. Something like rook e1. He simply has a move like queen c7 according to the computer. Where still, I mean, the bishop e4... Does look like white's position is a little bit more pleasant, specifically because I feel like a lot of the black players would go for knight c4 kind of business. Maybe there is rook d5 as an idea, and if they go greedy, we could even dream of some kind of uh, greedy gift uh, sacrifice. Like for instance, queen e2 could be interesting, knight can go back, and all of a sudden uh, we can make stuff like this work after knight g5, and then uh, we can bring the queen over. With a pretty fast mating net. So, uh, yeah, I think that's basically kind of it about this game. Uh, after he made this mistake with queen f6, we just kept on uh, making uh, tempo moves and our initiative basically just started snowballing. And after this final uh, kind of g4 important idea, opponent is simply tied down and they are almost like forced to blunder in these type of positions. So, uh, yeah. With that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game.